Great. So I'm really excited to be talking to you today. I've had amazing conversations so far, and it's a gorgeous campus, as I'm sure you all know and appreciate every day. So the talk is set against the backdrop of the ways that new technologies are shifting the landscape of healthcare. So people are using new devices to collect and interact with their data, from activity trackers for general health and wellness, to smart glucose monitors, to ingestible medications that, um, ingestible sensors that track your medication patterns. We're using technology to access our health information online forming communities with others who share our conditions, connecting to clinical data through patient portals and personal health records, and connecting to healthcare professionals, whether through online messaging or telemedicine. One population that's seen as especially well-suited for these new health technologies are older adults. We're seeing an increase in the aging population worldwide the population of people aged 60 and over is expected to double by 2050 from the number in 2015. And in response to caregiving shortages and older adults as frequent users of healthcare, there is a growing industry funding health technologies for aging. Um, one estimate saying we'll see the number going from 2 billion to 30 billion in the next few years. And governments internationally are funding research on technology to support older adults in living healthier lives. We're seeing technologies to help older adults live longer at home, such as smart medication dispensers, interfaces that support caregivers and family members in monitoring medication adherence, activity daily, activities of daily living, acute events such as falls, and also technologies to support older adults' social interactions, whether um, with family and friends, or even with artificial intelligence. So at the same time as we're seeing exciting technology developments in this area, we are also seeing a lot of rejection of this technology by older adults, um, not using the technologies that are so carefully designed for them. So the literature has attributed this to things like lack of usefulness. The technologies aren't meeting the real needs of older people, um, expense, experiences, past experiences, or lack of experience with technology. But the one I'm going to really focus in on for this talk is the ways that stigma and assumptions of technology designers affect technology design and the way technology is received by older adults. Um, in research and in the media, in the discussion of the increase in the number of older people worldwide, we often see this kind of doom and gloom language. The idea that the demographic shift that we're experiencing is this unwelcome but unavoidable event. Um, the term gray tsunami has been thrown around to describe the kind of oncoming onslaught of the older population. Researchers discuss older adults, um, discuss how older adults are sometimes seen as a homogenous population defined by physical and cognitive decline, seen as a burden on the resources of younger people. Aging is sometimes posed as a problem to which technology is the solution. And at the same time, older adults are often described as unwilling or unable to use these technologies, even when research has shown this to not always be the case. The negative ways of thinking about aging affect not only technology designers, but are also internalized by older people themselves. So some studies have found that older adults reject technologies, such as life alert devices, that have been marketed to older adults and signify dependence and frailty. So here we see ideas around health, aging, and technology coming together to affect the ways that technologies are designed for older people and the ways that they are received by them. My research lies at the intersection of health, technology, and aging. To inform my work, I draw on critical theoretical perspectives from human-computer interaction, drawing on literature that points to the importance of a shift from designing to compensate for perceived deficits to designing to empower, social justice-oriented design and feminist human-computer interaction, which emphasize the importance of researchers reflecting on their own assumptions about populations and how they affect the design process. And I also draw on perspectives from social and critical gerontology. 
Ageism is a term to describe how aging is often described as a period of decline rather than of continued opportunity. Um, the social construction of dementia perspective points out how the ways that we think about dementia often focus exclusively on structural changes in the brain rather than the major impact that the social environment has on our day-to-day -day lives. And Kate Swaffer's prescribed disengagement advances this view, helping us understand the ways that people with dementia, upon receiving a diagnosis, are often told to go home, get a power of attorney, and wait for death. And we don't really think about ways to help people with dementia self-manage their condition or find new opportunities as their abilities change. So I'm going to talk about three projects today where I draw on the lenses I discussed to examine technology. First, we're going to look at robotic pets as one instance of a health technology to understand narratives of aging. Then I'll present some work analyzing how health and aging shape the ways, ideas about health and aging shape the ways that older adults engage in activities and what this means for technology design in this area. And finally, I'll talk about a context in which these narratives of aging and dementia in particular are challenged. So first, starting with this project, looking at robotic pets. So why look at robots? Well, robots are one of those categories of technology that's being designed to support the aging population, in part motivated by a lack of caregivers available to provide care for people as they age. Robots designed for this population include healthcare robots for rehabilitation, medication delivery, assistance with home tasks, and also companion robots, which are intended to provide um, social interaction or recreation. There is a growing industry as well as national initiatives around robots for older adults, and also a lot of popular media interest in how robots can provide support to older adults. We did a study further delving into the media characterization of robots for healthcare through a discourse analysis of YouTube videos uploaded by a variety of organizations, including healthcare organizations. In these videos, hospital organizations explained that robots could not and would not replace staff in many settings because of the compassionate nature of care that patients um, expect and deserve. But in nursing homes, on the other hand, Robotic pets were often presented as having this almost magical ability to comfort and provide therapy to patients, um, such as older adults with dementia. So at the same time as we see these initiatives and this kind of pause in media discourse around robots for older adults, there are studies describing older adults' rejection of robotic technologies. Again, we see rejection attributed to things like age, gender, um, not meeting the needs people have, or preferences for some tasks and not others. But again, let's return to this idea around stigma and assumptions of designers. So specifically in regards to robots, some studies have found that older adults will distance themselves from robots that appear to have been designed for frail or isolated older adults. These studies have also found that even when research and researchers and designers um, attempt to engage in the appropriate user-centered design process, right? Talking to the end user, interviewing older adults about their needs, they inadvertently end up prioritizing the needs of staff and of caregivers and of their own assumptions about aging, even when this contradicts the things that the older adults are telling them. So to understand the disparity between the ways that robots are talked about for older adults and the ways that older adults appear to respond to these robots, we did a study asking how do older adults envision the role of robots in their lives? How do their preferences differ from assumptions made by robot designers? We conducted eight focus groups with 41 participants at community centers and independent living communities. We brought six examples of existing robotic pets to stimulate discussion. And we took a grounded theory approach to analyzing our data. I'm going to talk about three points that came out of these focus groups in terms of how robots are often designed, the kinds of assumptions about older adults that might be informing these approaches, and what the participants desired in our focus groups. So robots are often designed to provide companionship to older adults. There can be the assumption that the older person is isolated without a potential for a human company, and the robot is supposed to serve as the relational partner in interaction. 
but most participants rejected the idea of having a robot just to provide company. And instead, they wanted to use the robotic pet to augment their existing social networks, um, such as having another topic to talk about with their, um, their husband or meeting new neighbors. Um, they would look outside their window and see people walking their dogs past them. Um, and they couldn't have dogs in the retirement community they lived in. So they brainstormed how it would be fun to have a robotic pet that they could walk to the dog park to hang out with everyone else. Um, one person even spoke about taking the robotic pet on walks to meet people to date. One of the main reasons that robotic pets are often described as appealing to the older population is that they don't require maintenance. And some participants explained that unlike a live pet, they could never see themselves forming a relationship with a robot. So um, they could just imagine using it for functional assistance. But for the people who could envision themselves forming emotional relationships with these robots, they talked about how reciprocal functional assistance is actually woven into our relationships with other people. They expressed the desire to be able to take care of the robotic pet in some way. And finally, robotic pets, um, there's, there's a kind of ongoing debate in the literature about robotic pets for older adults with concerns around tricking, um, with one um, kind of key roboticist in the field saying, is it ethically justifiable to aim to create robots that people bond with? For example, in the case of elderly people or people with special needs. And we might see how this idea is based on an assumption of older adults as unable to make their own decisions. And participants spoke about possessing the ability to give in to the fiction. So they talked about how um, one participant spoke about her kind of ongoing relationship with Star Trek characters in the shows that she watched. She knew that she didn't actually have a relationship with them, but she kind of had this fiction. Others spoke about stuffed animals. Many people have stuffed animals and don't actually think of them as live pets, but you might wait it as you walk in the house or have little conversations with it now and then. So in this project, we see the way our narratives of aging are coming through in our technology design, but how they might misalign with the actual experience of older adulthood. Understanding this can lead to exciting new design directions, designing um, for topics between long married spouses, um, thinking about romantic opportunities um, for the aging population. And now I'm going to complicate the story a bit. So I'll talk about the ways that conceptions of health and aging affect the ways that older adults themselves engage in mundane activities, specifically leisure activities, and how this actually fits into um, these kinds of emerging and ongoing debates about designing technology for the aging population. So the robotic pet work that I just spoke about actually fits into this larger conversation about technology design for older adults. Researchers are discussing how there appears to be an overemphasis on health for the aging population, in particular, an overemphasis on physical and cognitive decline. Um, as neglecting the full um, picture of what it means to grow older. And as this conversation develops, we're seeing a growing focus on technology for other purposes in the academic literature, things like financial, um, gaming, creative engagements. So this study, trying to follow in that path, took on the topic of leisure activities. And we adopt Stebbins' definition of leisure activities as uncoerced activity engaged in during free time, which people want to do in either a satisfying or fulfilling way. So what do we already know about leisure activities? Well, we know that they are beneficial throughout the lifespan. And in older adulthood, they can provide a platform for self-expression and personal fulfillment, and also be helpful during difficult times and transitions. We also know that leisure activities change as people age. People engage less in activities like traveling, but continue to engage in the same amount with activities such as listening to the radio. So in this research, we seek to answer to questions such as what factors influence participation in leisure activities? And how do older adults decide which activities constitute leisure activities in order to inform technology design in this area? So for this study, we conducted two-hour interviews in participants' homes, 
Um, we went to their homes so that we could actually see them engage in some of these activities. Um, we observed them and took pictures. And um, we took, again, we took a grounded theory approach to analysis um, with, of interviews with 24 participants. So I'll just provide a very quick overview of the leisure activities people describe, just so you could keep it in mind through the rest of this um, talk. So the vast majority described watching TV, reading, and playing games. Many described computer use, interacting with pets, gardening, writing, and learning. And then some people had um, really unique activities, such as one woman with um, a lifelong button collection. The finding from this study that I'm going to talk about today is the ways that predominant societal narratives and attitudes towards aging, this idea of healthy aging in particular, affect how participants engage in leisure activities. So though some people um, were very certain about considering um, physical and cognitive exercises not to be leisure activities, Many others actually selected leisure activities in order to preserve physical and cognitive abilities, um, something that we colloquially refer to as the use it or lose it mentality. People describe doing activities like mahjong, crossword puzzles, even learning Japanese for brain health, and movement-based activities, yoga, um, pool aerobics, um, in order to preserve physical functioning. And this was done in a pretty intense way. So um, there's a sense of gripping tightly onto existing abilities, fighting the signs and symptoms of aging. Like with P22, shown here, um, working on a crossword puzzle, explaining that these puzzles start easy on a Monday. If I can do a Saturday, I feel like I've conquered the demons of old age. People directed this idea that negative signs and symptoms of aging could be fought if we only work hard enough outwards to others as well as inwards towards themselves. So P22, that participant with the crossword puzzles, told me that she has a friend who is starting to have trouble remembering things. She told this friend that she should start doing crossword puzzle to fight off these changes. And she also described her reaction when her friend refused to take her advice. She says, I get angry when I see people that have this problem and they don't do anything about it. We can turn to scholarship from critical gerontology that talks about how seeing people as entirely responsible for maintaining their own physical and cognitive abilities can be problematic because it shifts attention away from responsibilities that we may have as a society to provide equitable access to resources, to let people age without stigma, to include people of all ages in opportunities for lifelong learning. A second way that we found narratives of aging affect how people think about and approach activities was in this concept of age-appropriate activities. This includes ideas around activities that older adults should or should not engage in. So as one example, participants seem to be responding to this kind of dominant idea that there's not really a point in older people continuing to learn. So some use this to explain why they didn't learn anymore. But others acknowledge the idea almost in a defensive way, such as P13, who said, even at my age, 96, I still enjoy learning. And participants demonstrated their awareness of negative expectations or ideas about older adults, sometimes telling me how different they were from those people in the stereotypes, the people that lived down the hall from them. P2 told me about how basket weaving was an activity that they did in the place that he lived. He said that he really wasn't interested in this. I've seen too many pictures on TV where all the older people are sitting there doing this, and I'm not ready completely for that yet. He described how he was quite excited that the activity director had actually bought a computer and was looking forward to engaging in that activity. So in this example, we can see how in some cases, leisure activities are seen as negative and rejected just because they're associated with older people. And at the same time, these activities are thought of as something that one might need to do in the future as soon as they reach a certain age, even if it doesn't actually suit any individual personal interest. So even though we chose leisure to move away from health and ageist assumptions, we actually found that ideas about health and wellness are intertwined with the ways that older adults select the activities that fill their time. 
We argue that in responding to recent challenges to technology designers, to human computer interaction researchers, to move away from dominant medical models, we have to take a nuanced view that has space for people's own motivations about their health, even if they come in part from these internalized societal narratives that we might be simultaneously trying to dismantle. We can also reflect on the focus of our interventions for aging. Targeting individuals to support activities, um, engaging in activities could be really useful, but it shouldn't be our sole target. Or we might end up in a place where we can see how someone might blame their friend for developing cognitive impairment because they weren't working on enough crossword puzzles. So we can call attention to and expand computing research, calling attention to the many other factors that affect older adults' quality of life and well-being access to medical care and assistive technologies, affordable transportation and walkable sidewalks, understanding how technology contributes to and might dismantle stigma around aging. And finally, we can think about how our very presence or engagement with a research topic can position older people in a negative way. So I realize now that me, a younger person going in and asking all these older people, about the leisure activities they do is not actually a neutral situation for them. People felt the need to tell me how busy they were, um, even defending some of their activities to me. And we can imagine how this happened similarly with a range of other topics that we're very interested in when it comes to aging. Things like frailty, talking about people's cognitive abilities um, and changes that they're experiencing in relation to them. Thinking back, in, thinking back to that person who didn't like that basket weaving, how even letting someone know that you think about them as an older adult might put them in a particular position as they're interacting with you. So a useful starting point might involve reflecting on the language we use, the age diversity of our teams, and the perspectives that we have that shape our projects. Yes? For the people who were sort of rejecting the group affiliation as being, say, elderly, yeah. um, you know, I can obviously see them identifying as I am myself, but were, are there other groups that they instead identified with? So like, I'm not elderly, I'm something else? I don't remember any other, I think just the way that anyone might, right? So if it was a person who's interested in technology, I'm a person who's interested in technology. If it's an artist, they might say, I'm an artist. So I'd say that, but it's, it's really consistent with a lot of research projects where no one ever wants to be associated with older people. So they say, oh, this technology, I would never use this, but actually my mother would have loved it when she was older. Even if the mother they're thinking of was actually younger than they are now, right? Or people talk about the person down the hall that this would be great for, who's more frail or older than they are. So I talked about a case where we see narratives of aging permeating the ways that older people live their lives. And now I'm gonna present a context in which these narratives around aging and dementia in particular are challenged. So the narratives of aging that position older adults as isolated and emphasize physical and cognitive decline are amplified in dementia. So dementia is an umbrella term for conditions such as Alzheimer's disease, vascular dementia, Lewy body dementia. And it's a condition that we so often um, characterize by changes in memory, language, judgment, and problem solving. But a lot of the day-to-day -day quality of life when you are living with dementia is actually significantly affected by other factors. Um, the social environment, how you are seen and treated by others, um, the services that are available and the support that you receive. So in the past, we've looked at how others, um, art therapists in particular, counter negative narratives of dementia. For example, the way that they contextualize the expressions of people with dementia when sharing with others such as family members to highlight significance of what's being said and to avoid misinterpretation of others. How they create spaces through art exhibits for the voices of people who are so often not heard or valued by others. But I've become increasingly interested in the way that people with dementia themselves might be or might be supported in doing the same work. And we might see this 
idea is fitting into a bigger picture topic um, that's growing in the field of human computer interaction around health activism. So health activism is an attempt to change the status quo, including social norms, practices, and policies. It's different from health advocacy, which focuses on education and works within the existing system and biomedical model. So Parker proposed health activism as a way to go beyond the focus on individual determinants of health for marginalized populations that face disproportionate barriers to health in human-computer interaction. But even as this interest in this topic grows, we don't have a lot of cases of health activism yet, or an understanding of how different infrastructures might support or constrain engagement in this kind of activism. So I'm going to present a case of health activism of people with dementia, happening through an organization called Dementia Diaries. So with this organization, people with dementia, called diarists, call in to a number um, on their phones to leave a recording, which is then posted online to the website and sometimes to Twitter as well. So to understand what's going on here, um, we had the following research questions. How do people with dementia take an active role in challenging narratives of dementia? How can technology support vulnerable expressions of people with this condition? So 14 diarists with dementia, um, three supporters, um, which might be caregivers, in one case a translator, and two facilitators consented to be a part of this study, which involved the observation of a three-day gathering um, held by this organization that I attended in the UK, where I also did in-depth interviews with attendees. The average diarist age was 60 years, and I will point out that this reflects that the majority of people were diagnosed with early onset dementia, which is defined as dementia diagnosed before the age of 65. So this population is definitely skewed younger um, than the majority of those with the condition. And I'll also note that though we do not measure cognitive status or ask people about the stage they were in, you can think of um, people in the study as in about the mild to moderate stage. So people face some challenges with daily activities. Um, almost all were retired from work. They needed varying levels of support to attend the event, but people were very much able to engage in complex discussion, to express the important things that they care about verbally, and to consent um, on their own to take part in this study. So unlike other important work in the health space, the goal here is not primarily social support or seeking and sharing health information. Instead, it is to change attitudes. As the facilitator of the program told us, the goal of Dementia Diaries is to bring the real and raw voice of people with dementia to a wider audience, and by doing that, to influence attitudes and understanding. So the real and raw voices, the unshaped, authentic concerns and priorities of people with dementia is the mechanism that's intended to raise awareness. So at first, this doesn't seem special. Raising awareness of dementia is actually a quite common goal of a lot of organizations. Um, often about the signs of dementia to support earlier detection, or about the pervasiveness, the severity, um, the tragedy associated with the condition. So what are people raising awareness about on Dementia Diaries? Well, it comes down to showing that people with dementia have their humanity. P5 says, yes, you may have dementia, but you're still a person. Um, pretty significant in a condition that we so often associate with the loss of self. P8 talked about making a diary about his train ride to the gathering, about how he and his fellow riders were just having a normal conversation laughing, and how just seeing these kinds of mundane experiences can actually radically change attitudes of others about what people with dementia can and can't do. And being able to call in and leave a recording about an experience anytime, any place was quite accessible to people with dementia, a condition where the ability to recall events becomes increasingly difficult. But the wish to change perceptions of dementia also brought up some tensions with this intent of sharing the real and raw, right? the mechanism that's supposed to be what influences attitudes. And today, I'll just share one example. So people strove to share positive stories about life with dementia, to challenge these predominant negative narratives. 
P9 said that so many people turn their faces to the wall or think life has ended when they receive a diagnosis. I don't want to continue that. I have other places where I can moan, but I don't think Dementia Diaries is a place to do it. Some people in the gathering described a hesitation or reluctance to share negative times because they share the same desire to show that life goes on with dementia. But in response to this, the crowd, the gathering, um, said that people should use the diaries to share whatever they wished to, whatever was their authentic concern, priority, or truth. And this was a message that was reinforced throughout the gathering by facilitators, kind of the organizers of the event, and diarists as well. But we also found that this was not always 100% the case. So to go into this, let me explain the underlying infrastructure, infrastructure of the system that we learned about over the course of the gathering. So a diarist calls in, right? They leave a recording. A facilitator, um, an individual without dementia, will listen to that recording. If they have no concerns about the recording, they'll post it onto the website. But if they have a concern, they'll call up that diarist. They'll have a discussion with them. Um, sometimes the diary ends up being deleted, sometimes it ends up being edited, and sometimes the original one ends up being posted. So how do these facilitators, um, acting as moderators here, decide when to check in with diarists? Well, one thing moderators looked for was whether it seemed like something was being posted in heightened emotion. Um, so heightened emotion, P7 described the experience of being how they had always been blunt, but they've gotten more blunt and irritable with dementia. Facilitators of the organization wanted to make sure that people weren't sharing things that they would later regret, or in particular, things that might be hurtful to other people, so especially things that called other diarists by name. And they spoke of a couple times this had happened. And overall, diarists welcomed these check-ins from these trusted facilitators with whom they had built relationships over time. One said, it's nice to know that you're going to soften it in the gathering. And um, one of the participants really contextualized the importance of having someone to check on these messages, um, saying that the, with the mission of Dementia Diaries, we're spreading our influence in the world. The idea, if something wasn't good for one person, then it wasn't going to be good for everyone else. So in summary, we can think about this organization as a case of health activism, where diarists are engaging in direct action to challenge the medical paradigm. That a sense of trust built partially in person and over time supports online sharing. That sharing in the here and now is an accessible approach. But with more accessible ways to share for people with cognitive impairment, other tensions emerge such as what do you do if someone wants to share something in this emotionally heightened state that they later might regret, um, something that I think all of us can relate to. And we see this work, specifically the strategy of a trusted person checking in once this period of um, heightened emotion has passed, contributing to discussions of enhancing capacity and decision-making in dementia, a topic of growing interest as care moves in a more person-centered direction for this population. So I've spoken about three projects today where we see narratives of aging coming through in technology design, these narratives affecting the ways that people choose and engage in um, daily activities, and also the new opportunities that technology might open up, and also some of the tensions as we push past some of our assumptions of what people with dementia can and can't do. In this talk, I've argued that technology can position older people in ways that they don't always find welcome. Thinking back to the robotic pets as a recipient of care rather than someone in a reciprocal, mutually beneficial relationship. We're studying how technologies like augmented reality might support younger people in benefiting from learning from the wealth of knowledge, embodied skills, and multi-sensory um, skills that older people have built up over time positioning older people as sources of wisdom and interactions as mutually beneficial. And we're doing this project in the context of gardening, which makes for a very intense summer, because in Maryland, that's the only time you can do it. So this Dementia Diaries infrastructure, where people call in um, in the here and now to leave a message that's then posted online, 
works really well for some people with dementia. But what about as people progress in the condition? So with my student, Emma Dixon, on a project funded by the National Institute on Disability, Independent Living, and, the, and Rehabilitation Research, we're examining dementia through the lens of accessibility and trying to develop interfaces that can respond to, um, to the variations, the fluctuations that people experience. For example, if someone's experiencing a period of heightened emotion, do we want to defer the decision-making process until um, that time has passed? And finally, I talked about capturing authentic voices through organizations such as Dementia Diaries. But once we have these concerns, these priorities of people, what do we actually do with them? How can they better permeate our research and technology design and also bigger picture decisions? So to answer this question, I'm working with Alicia Pradhan, um, a PhD student at the University of Maryland. And we're collaborating with Mary Rudnofsky, a dementia rights advocate and a person living with dementia. And this project has led us in exciting directions that we definitely would not have arrived at on our own. And this work is actually part of a larger NSF funded project with Katie Seek and Ben Jellett at Indiana University Bloomington, where we're focusing on designing aging in place technologies for older retirees. So with that, I'll thank you for listening to my talk and really looking forward to any questions that you have.